The former president found liable for battery and defamation. Physically, she's not my type. And now that I've gotten indirectly to hear things about her, she wouldn't be my type in any way, shape, or form. The jury awards E. Jean Carroll $5 million finding Donald Trump liable in the case, despite the former president calling her allegations a hoax and a lie. What led the jury to decide against Trump and the national implications for him now? Plus... The sun seems brighter. The air seems warm. They say you never know what you got until it's gone. And they take your freedom away. You, you see how valuable it was to you. It's a rule that's led to millions behind bars for years on end. In our prime focus tonight, we take a look at the impact of Louisiana's three strikes rule that has resulted in the extended sentences of nonviolent offenders and speak to the groups trying to change that. And <laughs> we just was making it up as we yeah. went along. Like one of our iconic looks was the push it look, yeah. right? And that, that whole look has a history. They were on top of the music world in the 90s. Now they're looking back in honor of hip hop's 50th anniversary, Salt and Peppa sat down to discuss womanhood, career, and motherhood, and the impact women have had on the industry. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the charges just handed down against embattled Congressman George Santos by federal prosecutors. The new details being revealed about the shooting suspect behind that Allen, Texas mall massacre, plus the new guidelines for women in detecting breast cancer, what those guidelines are and what you can do now. And family, turmoil, addiction, and mental health struggles, the problems faced by Aaron Carter, and how his story is now being chronicled for the world. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we do begin with the verdict in the civil trial accusing former President Trump of sexual assault and defamation. The jury found Trump liable for battery and defamation in the suit by E. Jean Carroll and awarded her $5 million. The former magazine columnist claimed Trump raped her in a dressing room at Bergdorf Goodman, an upscale department store back in the 90s, but she couldn't remember exactly when it allegedly took place. The jury found Trump did not rape Carol, but sexually abused her. The former president did not appear at his own trial, but the jury heard what he said in a deposition. He had rejected Carol's claim, saying she wasn't his type. Tonight, Trump is out with a quick response, and E. Jean Carroll is also weighing in on the verdict. Our senior investigative reporter, Aaron Katursky, leads us off tonight from New York. Well, historically, that's true with stars. He bragged in his deposition that stars could get away with sexually assaulting women. But tonight, a jury in New York took less than three hours to find that former President Donald Trump sexually abused writer E. Jean Carroll, ordering him to pay her $5 million in damages. How do you feel? The six men and three women of the jury found that Trump sexually abused Carol in a department store dressing room in the 1990s, though they were not convinced he raped her as she had claimed. They did agree Trump defamed Carol by calling her story a complete con job, a hoax and a lie, and insisting Carol was not my type. Carol's lawyers seized on that statement, showing the jury the moment in a deposition when Trump saw a photo of Carol and confused her for his ex-wife, Marla Maples. It's Marla. You say Marla's in this photo? That's Marla, yeah. That's, that's my wife. Which one, woman are you pointing to? No. That's Here. Carol. Oh, that, the oh, person well. you just pointed to was oh, Eugene Carroll. Carroll's team said that moment proved Carroll was exactly Donald Trump's type. And they argued the way he treated her fit a pattern of behavior. Two other women testified he had assaulted them too. And jurors heard Trump's own words on the now infamous Access Hollywood video. Beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. <laughs> I don't even know it. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Carol's team called that a confession, pressing Trump in his deposition. Well, historically, that's true with stars. It's true with stars that, that they can grab women by the Well, that's what, it's, if you look over the last million years, I guess that's been largely true. Not always, but largely true. Unfortunately or fortunately. Trump, who was repeatedly given the opportunity to testify, never once attended the trial a decision his attorney defended today. What more can he say other than I didn't do it? Tonight, Trump calling the verdict a disgrace, a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. His lawyer says he will appeal. Could be a long, drawn-out process still. Aaron Katursky joins us. Now, what is E. Jean Carroll saying tonight, Aaron? In a statement issued after court, Lindsay, E. Jean Carroll said she filed this lawsuit to clear her name and restore her life. She also said that the world now finally knows the truth about what happened. 
E. Jean Carroll called the outcome here, Lindsay, a victory not just for her, but for all women who have suffered because they have not been believed. Lindsay? Aaron Katursky for us. Thanks so much, Aaron. Former President Trump came out with a quick but brief response on his social media platform, Truth Social, calling the verdict a disgrace and part of the greatest witch hunt of all time. ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, joins us now. And John, it sounds like the former president and his team are already planning to appeal. Uh, they say that it already will appeal. But look, Lindsay, this is the latest in a long string of losses uh, for Donald Trump in court. And there are likely to be more losses to come or more legal setbacks to come. Uh, they will appeal this. But this is more than a legal setback or even a financial setback for Donald Trump. It is also a political setback. You now have the judgment of a jury that he committed sexual abuse. And in the course of this case, you had, once again, the lowest point of Donald Trump's political career, perhaps, the Access Hollywood tape, come back to the fore, uh, people hearing that again, and also hearing him say, yet again, that he believes that celebrities, stars, uh, are able to sexually assault women. And in this case, he actually made it worse uh, by adding those words, unfortunately or fortunately. So you can be sure that whoever Donald Trump runs against, either in the Republican primaries or in the general election, if he gets there, uh, will remind voters of what he said in this case and what the jury said uh, that he did. Jonathan Carl for us from the nation's capital. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, Lindsay. For more on this verdict, let's bring in criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Bernarda Villalona. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so $5 million gets awarded to E. Jean Carroll. How significant do you think this is, especially considering he's a former president? So this is a significant win for E. Jean Carroll. One for her is vindication. Finally, she feels vindicated that this man was defaming her for all these years and saying that she that this is a hoax, that she's crazy, that she's making this up. So for her, a personal huge victory, but also another victory in terms of the Me Too movement, but also third, another victory because you're talking about the former president, a person who has said he is the Teflon Don, that he can get away with anything and everything. And here you have it. The Southern District of New York, a jury of your peers has said and found you liable for defamation and battery. So liable for battery and defamation, but not of rape. Why do you think the jury came to that conclusion and why the distinction? Well, it doesn't really even make any sense in the sense of the, is it a big deal? It's not a big deal because we're talking about a civil case as opposed to a criminal case. Either way, in this civil case where the burden is completely different than a criminal case, a jury still found that Donald Trump, that he had contact, sexual contact with the private area of Miss E. Jean Carroll. So whether it's rape, rape is different in the sense of there has to be penetration of his penis in order to find him liable for rape itself. But either way, they found a battery. And what I think really did him in is, number one, his statement, the Access Hollywood statement, where I can grab him by the pocketbook. That right there is sexual assault. And also the two other victims that came forward and said that they also had a sexual encounter that's similar to that of E. Jean Carroll. And taking those two into account is what led this jury to find him liable on the battery, having to deal with the sexual assault and the defamation charge. Of course, uh, Trump decided not to even show up, decided not to testify. How damning do you think that that was? I think that played a huge role. You got to think with Donald Trump not even showing up for your own trial plays a role in human beings and the citizens like look this is your own case and you don't really think much of it and let's just be clear he doesn't have to show up this is a civil case so he chose not to show up but he did show up in the sense of his deposition mm -hmm. was played in the courtroom and that's all the jury needed to see his reaction when he was confronted with the access hollywood video as well as the photograph where you have e jean carroll in a photograph and he mistakes it for his wife when he said oh no she's not my type but hey Hey, you just said, oh, no, that's Marla, and Marla's the Marion type. So now we've already heard from Trump's team that they plan to appeal. 
What are the chances that Eugene Carroll ever sees this $5 million, or will this just continue to stay locked up and litigated? This is going to be a long time before E. Jean Carroll sees any money in this case, because an appeal can take many years. It's not something that is quick. And you know with Donald Trump, Donald Trump is definitely going to fight this until the bitter end. And his team has already said that. So in terms of grounds for an appeal, I think one of the grounds is, one, to access Hollywood tape being allowed into evidence. Second is those other two two victims that were allowed to testify about something that had nothing to do with E. Jean Carroll. But let's just be clear, any objection that Mr. Tacopino or that team made and wasn't ruled on in their favor is grounds for an appeal. Doesn't mean that he'll be successful on an appeal. Bernardo Villalona, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you. Now to breaking news out of Washington. Sources tell ABC News that federal prosecutors have just filed criminal charges against embattled New York Congressman George Santos. Santos has admitted to lying about many parts of his life, including his resume, his college degree, also his family background. ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott is on Capitol Hill. Rachel, what do we know about these charges and what's next for Santos? Well, Lindsay, sources are telling us tonight that Congressman George Santos could appear in court as early as tomorrow. The exact charges remain unknown. They are under seal in that indictment. But Republican Congressman George Santos has been accused of fabricating almost every detail of his life, from his resume to his background. But sources tell us that the focus of this investigation is on the money and whether or not he illegally used campaign finances. Santos has still refused to answer many questions, including how he made $55,000 and then personally loaned his campaign more than half a million dollars two years later. We also know that the FBI has been looking into whether he used a fake charity to rip off a veteran and his dying dog. Sources tell me that Santos was caught off guard by this announcement. He has refused to step down through it all, remaining defiant, and tonight his office declined to comment, Lindsay. Rachel Scott for us from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Rachel. Now to the investigation into the mass shooting at the mall in Allen, Texas. Police say the suspect had eight weapons with three on him, all of them purchased legally. They confirmed his social media included references to Nazi ideology as well as hateful messages about women and minorities. ABC's chief national correspondent Matt Gutman is in Allen, Texas once again for us tonight. Authorities revealing tonight the suspect who wreaked terror on that Dallas area mall, murdering eight, purchased all of his guns legally. He had eight weapons with him. He had three on his person, and he had five in his vehicle. Investigators reviewing this picture of the 33-year-old suspect, Mauricio Garcia, and his social media profile. We do know that he had neo-Nazi ideation. He had patches, he had tattoos, uh, even his signature, you know, verified that. Images uploaded to an account last month indicating the gunman may have visited the outlet mall multiple times over the past year, even researching its peak hours. To me, it looks like he targeted the location rather than a specific group of people. Is there any way that you think you can protect the public from the next mass shooting if anyone, a suspect like this man who we know was discharged from the military over mental health concerns can go out and purchase an armload of firearms? When you have people with mental illness, if, this, if it turns out that this gentleman has that, uh, when you have that situation, they will find a way. Tonight, with that memorial growing, the names of all eight victims released. Among them, Q and Cindy Cho murdered with their three-year-old son, James. Their six-year-old, William, the only survivor. Just heart-wrenching that he is the sole survivor. Matt Upman is in Allen, Texas again. Matt, what other details did we learn from the press conference today? Lindsay, we learned more about his social media profile, the swastika and Nazi type tattoos on his body. We also learned, chillingly, that the suspect for many years had been a security guard. And an update about little William, that six-year-old who survived his family killed, he is expected to recover fully, physically, at least. Lindsay. At least there's that bit of good news. Matt Cutman, our thanks to you. Thousand migrants a day are expected to cross the southern border when Title 42 is set to expire on Thursday night. President Biden has spent 500 troops there. Texas National Guardsmen are there as well. In El Paso, ICE agents have been waking up migrants to warn them to register or risk being sent home right away. That's where our Maria Villarreal reports from tonight. Tonight, ICE agents going tent to tent forcing migrants in El Paso to pack up and get processed now or risk deportation. 
It comes as more Texas National Guard troops head to the border. Over 900 stationed in El Paso alone as the end nears for Title 42, that Trump era health policy allowing authorities to quickly expel migrants based on COVID concerns. If they cross the border illegally, they're going to be sent back and they're going to be barred from seeking asylum for five years. Authorities bracing for up to 10,000 migrants crossing daily. And this is where they want to get to, this wall in El Paso where hundreds already wait to come in. This man wiping away tears. He says he's been waiting for eight days. Is your crime because you're happy? <laughs> but tonight, frustration along the border. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs critical of the federal government's response. Without much more robust action from the federal government, the current situation will only get worse. And now Chicago and New York State declaring states of emergency. New York's governor, Kathy Hochul, saying, quote, a disaster is imminent. The governor, they're not trying to sugarcoat it. Maria Villarreal joins us now. Maria, we got a readout of a call between President Biden and Mexico's president today on how to deal with this unprecedented migration. What do we know about that call? Hey, Lindsay, you know, the White House basically says that the two actually discuss continued efforts to address migration, including the return of stricter consequences for people found in the United States illegally uh, after Title 42, and that ends on Thursday. But even after Thursday, we've also been able to confirm that the United States will be able to continue to send migrants back to Mexico that are from Haiti, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. Lindsay? Maria Villarreal for us. Thanks so much, Maria. Now to the debt ceiling showdown with the risk of default looming just weeks away. President Biden and congressional leaders of both parties met today at the White House, but they remain deadlocked. So what happens next? Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Just weeks away from potential default and with the American economy hanging in the balance, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy today heading to the White House for that critical face-to-face -face meeting. The president is finally willing to negotiate. The president insists he will do no such thing, welcoming the top four congressional leaders to the Oval Office to demand that Congress raise the debt limit and pay the nation's bills without conditions. We're going to get started. We're going to solve all the world's problems. Okay. Mr. President, can you know this? Republicans say they won't raise the debt limit unless Biden agrees to deep spending cuts that would gut his agenda, slashing social spending and environmental programs. Biden accuses Republicans of holding the economy hostage. I didn't see any new movement. Without an agreement, the U.S. is expected to run out of money to pay its bills as soon as June 1st. Social security payments will halt. Troops will go unpaid. The stock market will plunge. Interest rates will spike. And by one projection, six million people could lose their jobs. Tonight, President Biden's not ruling out invoking the 14th Amendment, which would allow him to raise the debt ceiling on his own. I made clear during our meeting that default is not an option. Let's go to Mary Bruce at the White House. Mary, President Biden spoke after today's meeting. What did he have to say? And do we expect these leaders to meet again? Yeah, well, Lindsay, the president is promising to do everything in his power to avoid default, including, as you heard there, possibly invoking the 14th Amendment, which would let him go around Congress to avoid default. He's also not ruling out the possibility of some kind of short-term extension to try and raise the debt limit. But he recognizes that both of these options are fraught, could be challenged in court, and don't remove the risk to the economy. He is planning to meet again here at the White House with congressional leaders on Friday. But, Lindsay, the bottom line tonight is that the threat of default and the risk of that economic pain to Americans is still very real. Lindsay. It certainly is. Mary Bruce from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. Goldman Sachs has settled a gender discrimination suit for $215 million. That suit claimed that the bank discriminated against women when it came to pay, performance, evaluations, and promotions. The lawsuit was filed more than a decade ago in 2010 and was set to go to trial next month. The plaintiffs in the case are women who work for Goldman within the investment, banking, management, or securities divisions. The settlement covers 2,800 female associates and vice presidents. In Moscow tonight, Russian President Vladimir Putin presided over Victory Day celebrations the country's biggest national holiday. Celebrations were scaled back this year. A lone Soviet-era tank drove into Red Square, followed by armored vehicles with no modern tanks in the traditional military parade. Putin blamed the West for unleashing a real war, even as a new barrage of Russian missiles target Kyiv. ABC's Marcus Moore is in Ukraine. Tonight, a dramatically scaled-down Victory Day parade in Moscow, marking the Nazis' defeat in 1945. 
a lone World War II era T-34 rumbled across Red Square, which in years past would have been filled with modern Russian tanks. A defiant Vladimir Putin claiming the West had unleashed, quote, a real war against Russia and compared Ukraine to Nazi Germany. There was also no military flyover today as in the past, and parades in at least two dozen other Russian cities were canceled. It comes a week after a purported drone attack on the Kremlin that raised questions about security there, though it is still not clear who was behind it. The anemic show of force today, a reflection of Russia's degraded military on the battlefield, still unable to take towns like Bakhmut it has fought over nine months for. Ukrainians also claim to have shot down 23 of 25 missiles launched by Russians today. And the Pentagon confirming a U.S.-made Patriot missile shot down a Russian hypersonic missile over Ukraine last week. The Russians claim the hypersonic missile can fly at Mach 10, faster than two miles per second. Our thanks to Marcus Moore. Turning now to the Middle East, where at least 10 Palestinians have been killed in strikes by Israeli Defense Forces. The Palestinian Ministry of Health said the IDF's operation happened early Tuesday morning in Gaza. Three senior members of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad were killed, along with at least a dozen civilians. In a press release, the IDF said that they were striking Islamic Jihad targets in Gaza. The Home Front Command instructed civilians in the area surrounding Gaza to shelter in place. The IDF closed all border points connected to the Gaza. A strip. Still much more ahead tonight on Prime coming up. New recommendations on breast cancer screenings. Why a federal task force now suggests starting it 10 years earlier at 40 years old. But next in our Prime Focus, people sentenced to life in prison for nonviolent crimes. How a nonprofit group and prosecutors are joining together to get those offenders out of prison. How many of those cases, roughly, who you've gotten out of jail, who were in jail for long prison sentences? Oh, there are dozens. There are do dozens of men and women who were in jail for sentences that probably would have been closer to a year, three years, five years. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest story. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there.
everyone, I'm Lindsay Davis. We begin tonight here in Buffalo, London, in Alaska. Uvalde, Kentucky, reporting in from Poland. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? Did you ever have a conversation about an abortion? Is she lying? Yes, she's lying. Arguably the most controversial Supreme Court ruling in history. Mm -hmm. What's the impact on you now? Do you have a future political aspiration? Absolutely. You ready for this? Go! He ran for Senate, President, now running for Governor. I take it you'd like to run. <laughs> this is the calling card. ABC News Live! Oh, You're gonna deliver a show that will be remembered forever. Ooh, the press on me! Finish this sentence. I want young girls to know. <sighs> I mean, you are just <laughs> a tough, bad <laughs> You never know what you're gonna get on this show. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely, always. absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right, they don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. Three strikes. It's something that's become common in the American criminal justice system, penalizing people convicted of multiple felonies for years on end. But it's not just a punishment reserved for those who commit violent crimes. Many nonviolent offenders are also sentenced under these same laws. In tonight's Prime Focus, we travel to Louisiana, where some have received life sentences for carrying small amounts of drugs worth only a few dollars. ABC's Steve Osinsami takes a deeper look at what's going on and examines the pivotal moment that led so many states to adopt these laws and the groups trying to change them. And tomorrow, if the sun don't shine, I know that you're forever mine, so I'm forever yours. Deep in the Louisiana Bayou, Cody Fleming is celebrating his freedom. They treated me like I was lost. That's when I studied the rules of wrong and right. But soon I just... After 19 long years, he's finally on the better side of a jail cell, trying to make up for lost time. I don't worry about tomorrow because she today ain't even over yet. And chasing a record career with all he has. My mission is to go double platinum, gold and good enough to blame even though his you His rhymes are his protests, you play the scales of justice that sent him here up to place. Angola. Um, one of the most violent you, prisons in America. What do you say about whether or not it was fair and right and just? The only thing that was unfair was the sentence. Mm. Life. The life sentence. The life sentence. He got more than a life sentence. A Louisiana court sent him to prison forever with no chance of parole after he was convicted in 2004 for selling three pieces of crack cocaine to an undercover police officer. It's a crime he says he owns and in most cases would have sent him to jail for as few as two years. But this was his third drug conviction. They were all nonviolent crimes, but with number three, the prosecutor was able to charge him as a habitual felony offender. Under Louisiana law, the judge had no choice but to throw the book at Cody Fleming and sentence him to die in prison. Well, my, my daughter's mother was behind me. On, she was on the floor screaming and hollering, so I had to really show strength. But my mind was on, like, life. <laughs> what, what do you mean? He shared a cell block with 85 men. He says it's the only place where he's ever had to watch someone die. You get to Angola now, and there are other inmates who are doing life sentences. But what are they doing life sentences for? Rape, robbery, murder, distribution of marijuana. That was my best friend. He, he sold $5 worth of marijuana three times and got a life sentence. Three strikes and you're out. The expression is about as American as the baseball diamonds from where it came. And four to two. And it was former President Bill Clinton who signed what was famously known as the Three Strikes Law when he put his signature on the federal crime bill of 1994. <laughs> and one of the proud lawmakers whose hand he shook immediately after signing that law was none other than its author in the U.S. Senate, our current president, Joe Biden. 
The law was an answer to 1992, when crack cocaine was an epidemic in the streets and America recorded more violent crimes than ever before. Soon there was a rush of about two dozen state legislatures passing strong repeat offender laws and in many cases refusing to make any difference between violent and nonviolent criminals. Critics called this another example of a judicial system that's bent against brown and black people. In a famous case out of Louisiana involving a stolen pair of hedge clippers, a black state Supreme Court justice wrote that these long sentences are the modern manifestation of racist laws passed by southern states after the Civil War that were largely designed to re-enslave African Americans. The nine justices of the U.S. Supreme Court had their official photo taken today. But in 2003, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that however harsh these habitual offender laws are constitutional, agreeing with the state of California and ruling against Gary Ewing. He was a career thief who was sentenced to life after stealing a set of golf clubs. In 2012, he died in prison. Today, both the former and current president regret passing that federal law. I signed a bill that made the problem worse. And I want to admit it. Most of these people are in prison under state law, but the federal law set a trend. And that was overdone. We were wrong about that. Was it a mistake to support it? Yes, it was. But here's, the, here's where the mistake came. The mistake came in terms of what the states did locally. In the last few years, a number of states have started walking back their repeat offender laws just a bit. And Louisiana is one of them, allowing certain nonviolent repeat offenders to go home. It's how this man, Barney Holt, was able to leave Angola prison last year, where he was serving a life sentence for three drug convictions. Kat Forrester and the lawyers from a group called the Innocence Project New Orleans are the people who helped set him free. Barney spent 12 years in prison. He was given the habitual offender law and sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison. Last year, the state started allowing prisoners serving long sentences under repeat offender laws a way out of prison. If their crimes were nonviolent, they can now ask a parole board to let them out, but only if they've already served at least 15 years. We represent people during their parole hearings. We prep them, we work with their family members. We... You also then set up, don't you initiate the parole hearing too? Yes. It's how they set Cody Fleming free. December 15th, 2022. Walk me through, was it cold that day? No. It was warm. Warm. The sun seems brighter. The air seems warmer. They say you never know what you got until it's gone. And they take your freedom away. You, you see how valuable it was to you. The walls in this New Orleans law office are a bittersweet hall of fame. Here's Cody Fleming. There's Barney Holt. And this is Thomas Swinner, who was in for life after a marijuana conviction, a drug that became legal in large parts of this country while he was in jail. There's one picture they ask our cameras to linger on, and it's of 63-year-old James Baker, who was in for drugs and walked away from a life sentence in February. They say he had no idea the law had changed in his favor until the lawyers here happened to discover his case. There are at least 100 people that we know of who are eligible under the new rules for parole, and these are people who are convicted of crimes in which no one was hurt. And it sounds like you've got uh, prosecutors who are willing to work with you now. There are a number of prosecutors in Louisiana who are willing to work with us, absolutely. Thank Welcome you. to the city. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. One of those prosecutors is this New Orleans district attorney who promised that he would never use the state's habitual offender law when he ran for office. How many of those cases roughly who you've gotten out of jail who were in jail for long prison sentences? Oh, there are dozens. There are do dozens of men and women who were in jail for sentences that probably would have been closer to a year, three years, five years. The habitual offender law was absolutely used in a racist inequitable way. Jason Williams is a former defense lawyer with former clients who he says were unfairly sentenced. We have a, a very robust victim survivor outreach program. So we reach out to the victims and we let them know uh, that we're reviewing the case, why we're reviewing the case. Many times victims uh, and survivors weren't even aware that the habitual offender law was going to be used in their case. What we're trying to do is just uh, inject a bit of humanity 
uh, into the criminal legal system. But he admits that just two years into office, he had to break his promise when he helped send a man to jail for life, a violent repeat offender who raped a young woman. I believe some people need to be in jail. Let me be very clear about that. It is the job of a prosecutor to decide who those folks are and to decide who does not need to be in jail. I can tell you that there was a campaign promise not to use habitual offender law, but there's also an oath of office and there's a mandate uh, to do the job and live up to that mandate. Cody Fleming says it may sound surprising, but he's not mad at the world. He's more upset with himself and what this did to his family. It's really the family that held me through prison. Yeah, family, friends, they, they, shared, they shared the prison sentence with me. I think that each of the people that we freed from prison has something to share with the world. Some of their gifts are more overt, you know, and some of them, I think, are more subtle. Sometimes it's somebody's sense of humor or their smile or the impact that it has on their family to have them home. It wasn't a day that went by I didn't think about you and my sisters. It's the message he now pours into his music as he struggles to put his life back together, that he will never again put himself before the mercy of the system. What gives you joy right now? To sit in a bathtub with candles lit, with bubbles everywhere, <laughs> listening to music out loud instead of with headphones on. That's what gives me joy, freedom. Freedom, something he no longer takes for granted. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami for that. Still much more to get to coming up after Jonathan Majors appears in court on allegations he assaulted a woman, what new documents reveal about the victim's accusations. But next, will your summer vacation cost more this year? We take a look at travel destinations and plans by the numbers. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Almond Mom is a little bit bought into diet culture, but it tends to veer on the side of overdoing it. I had to hit spin class, you know, I had to earn this food. To be in a restrictive mode with food is almost like the worst joke ever. Food should not be good or bad. Every soul's body is important, no matter what size it is. Where body positivity has the potential to become detrimental is the, nah, girl, you're good. Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Summer is thankfully just around the corner, and the travel app Hopper is out with new data on summer vacation plans and what you can expect cost-wise. Let's take a look by the numbers. For those looking to travel overseas, airfares to Europe and Asia are up 36%. That's the highest in five years. Trips to Europe are averaging more than $1,100 a ticket, while Asia trips are coming in just over $1,800 per ticket. That's up more than $300 from last summer. The current domestic airfare is averaging about $360 dollars a ticket that's down 19 percent from last summer and up only six percent compared to the pre-pandemic summer of 2019 according to hopper so those traveling domestically this summer might be able to catch a bit of a break but it may cost a bit more to stay where you're going u.s hotel prices are up about 11 percent since last summer the top destinations seeing price increases up to 50 percent higher for those hitting the road in a rental car will be glad to hear that prices are down about 17 percent from last summer when a rental 
rental car shortage was still plaguing travel. The average rental car price is about $46 a day for the summer. As for where people are planning to go this summer, the top three domestic travel locations are New York City, Orlando, and Vegas. And the top three international destinations are London, Paris, and Tokyo, according to Hopper. And we still have much more ahead on Prime tonight. Video captures the terrifying moments a skier is trapped inside an avalanche, and they open the doors for female rappers becoming one of the most iconic duos in music history. Salt and Peppa talk about their lasting contributions to hip hop. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. With a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Almond Mom is a little bit bought into diet culture, but it tends to veer on the side of overdoing it. I had to hit spin class, you know, I had to earn this food. To be in a restrictive mode with food is almost like the worst joke ever. Food should not be good or bad. Every soul's body is important, no matter what size it is. Where body positivity has the potential to become detrimental is the, nah, girl, you're good. Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. 13 women opened their doors to the man who would end their lives. Truth and Lies, The Boston Strangler, the new true crime podcast series. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts and watch Boston Strangler starring Kira Knightley streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The new details revealed as actor Jonathan Majors appeared in court. The scary video of skiers were caught in an avalanche and the 79-year-old actor who just became a dad again. These stories and more in tonight's Rundown. A status hearing in New York for Hollywood actor Jonathan Majors charged with assaulting his girlfriend in March. Court documents include the alleged victim's statement that Majors pulled her finger, grabbed her arm, and struck her with his hand. Majors appeared virtually for the hearing, followed by a statement from his attorney claiming to have provided the district attorney with irrefutable evidence the woman is lying. The attorney adding this is a witch hunt against Majors driven by baseless claims. 
Paramount Global is reportedly reducing its staff by 25% and shutting down MTV News. Bloomberg News reports that Paramount employees found out about the layoffs today and that Paramount is consolidating many of its teams as part of a major realignment. The news comes after Paramount recently announced a merger between Showtime and MTV Studios. It also means the end of four decades on the air for MTV News, which was famed as a hub for music and pop culture. Stunning video shows professional skier Connor Ryan swallowed up by snow. Tumbling down Colorado's King Solomon Mountain in the first of two unusually powerful spring avalanches. Connor's friend, Ryan McClure, started making his way down to help when calls of another avalanche came through, with Ryan getting caught. Connor then climbed down and helped put Ryan's broken leg in a tourniquet. The rest of the group called for medical rescue and Ryan was rushed to the hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Fort Cavazos, Texas, the home of the 3rd Armored Corps. The Fort Hood military base is now to be officially known as Fort Cavazos. The new name became official at a ceremony today in Texas. The move is part of an effort to rename nine U.S. Army installations to erase commemorations of the Confederate States of America. Fort Cavazos honors the late General Richard Cavazos, who became the first Latino four-star general in the Army. Let his name and all that it represents inspire us all every single day to live up to his legacy. Congratulations are in order for legendary actor Robert De Niro. A rep for the 79-year-old has confirmed that he is a father once again. The two-time Oscar winner now has seven children. No other details were provided about the newborn. De Niro first referenced the new baby during an interview with ET Canada while promoting his new film About My Father. I know you have six kids, um, but like, seven, have you... I just had a baby. Seven? Oh my goodness, congratulations. The jewels worn by the late Princess Diana in her final public appearance are hitting the auction block. Diana's Swan Lake suit with a matching necklace and earrings will be put up on June 27th by Guernsey's. Princess Diana wore the necklace for a performance of Swan Lake at London's Royal Albert Hall in June 1997. The jeweler took the necklace back afterwards to complete the earrings, but was not able to give her the full set before her death. A Utah mother of three who wrote a book about grief after the sudden death of her husband is now charged with his murder. Prosecutors say Corey Richin spiked a cocktail that she made for him with five times a lethal dose of fentanyl. They say he'd warned friends that, quote, if anything happens to me, it's her. ABC's Kana Whitworth has these details. Corey Richin says she published her children's book, Are You With Me?, to help her three young sons cope with the unexpected loss of their father, Eric, last year. It's just comforting to them to know that they're not living this life alone. Like, mm -hmm. Dad is still here, it's just in a different way. But tonight, she's been charged with her husband's murder, accused of fatally poisoning him inside their Camas, Utah home. Charging documents alleging the 33-year-old called 911 in the middle of the night last March, saying she found her husband lying unresponsive and cold to the touch at the foot of their bed. Richens telling police she had given her husband a Moscow Mule cocktail earlier to celebrate a business deal before falling asleep in one of their children's beds, waking up to discover her husband's body. A medical examiner later finding Eric had five times the lethal dosage of fentanyl in his system. Court documents also alleging that less than three weeks before his death, Eric told a friend he thought his wife, Corey, was trying to poison him when he fell ill after a Valentine's Day date. And Lindsay, the court documents allege that Corey tried to make herself the sole beneficiary on Eric's life insurance policy prior to his death. And Lindsay, she has her next court appearance on May 19th. Kena, thank you. Aaron Carter was a chart-topping pop star who toured the world with hits like I Want Candy, famous by nine and struggling by 20. The teen sensation fell amidst family turmoil and mental health struggles and eventually grappled with addiction, which ultimately took his life. His story is now chronicled in a new Hulu documentary, Aaron Carter, the Little Prince of Pop from ABC News Studios. In this preview clip, longtime family friend A.J. McLean shares how he said he tried to help the late star. I was a functioning addict. I've been in and out of the rooms since 2001. So for 22 years, I've been battling my own. I almost lost my marriage. I almost lost my band. Um, I almost lost my life. The last time I relapsed, um, which would be 18 months ago, 
you know, my youngest daughter was kind of the nail in the coffin for me. She said, I, I didn't smell like her dad. That was enough. That, that pretty much did it in for me. And I have stayed sober since. And I plan on staying sober. And it's a daily thing. 2017, Aaron reached out to me, asked me for help. And I said, look, if you get on a plane and you come out to LA, I will make sure you get into treatment. And he showed up. I was shocked, but I was happy. And he checked in to a treatment center in Malibu. A couple days later, I talked to him. And then he kind of went off the map. And I think it was maybe two weeks. So I called my friends at the treatment center, and they said he checked himself out. Aaron Carter, the little prince of pop, is now streaming on Hulu. Now to the major health news for women with a federal task force making draft recommendations that most women of average risk should start screening for breast cancer every other year starting at the age of 40. That's 10 years earlier than prior task force recommendations for most women. For more on this, let's bring in ABC News chief medical correspondent, Dr. Jen Ashton. Thank you, Jen, for being here. Good to be with you, Lynn. So let's just get a sense of the data that led to this recommendation. Well, first of all, for historical perspective, back in 2010, the same group, the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force did the opposite. They recommended starting screening at age 50 when it used to be age 40. That was met with a lot of uproar, a lot of controversy. Now they have 14 years of data, and guess what they found? higher rates of breast cancer, more aggressive breast cancer in women in their 40s, particularly amongst black women who we know are already facing a 40% greater risk of mortality or death when they get a breast cancer diagnosis. So that's the historical context. With science, with public health, with medicine, we always have to be open and flexible to new data and able to pivot and shift our recommendations. And that's what you're seeing here. The opponents, however, of course, from 2010 will say, when you screen less, it's not really a surprise that you're gonna see greater rate rates of breast cancer. Are there risks of screening too early too often? 100%, and so when you recommend a treatment or a screening test, you always have to balance risk versus benefit. Mammogram is the gold standard for breast cancer screening, but it is not perfect. There are false positives, particularly in women with dense breast tissue, which looks white on a mammogram, just like a tumor. So uh, they can miss tumors, they can see things that are not cancer, which are the false positives. And so like anything, you have to weigh those risks with the benefits of it finding early cancers um, and, and the better prognosis that comes along with that. Who falls into the category as far as who should get screened earlier than 40 and perhaps more often than these recommendations? Well, what you're asking is such an important question because the key words in their draft recommendations, Lindsay, are average risk yeah. and unfortunately 80 percent of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer were average risk until they received that diagnosis so they're being clear um, with these draft recommendations that it's the average risk cis woman who it does not apply to a woman with a first degree relative who's had breast cancer she's not at average risk or a woman with a breast cancer mutation uh, that increases her risk. You know, there are some other groups in there as well, but those are the two main groups that are not included in these recommendations. Bottom line, how significant would you say these recommendations are? What could it mean for detecting cancer going forward? Well, I think we're gonna see the curve go in the opposite direction. There are some missing pieces of recommendations here that a lot of specialists, uh, including myself, are looking for, hoping for, and waiting for. Um, it would be great to see specific recommendations for women of color, because we know that, that that cancer behaves differently in black women. It would be great to see specific recommendations for women who have dense breasts. That's 50% of all women. And it would be great to see specific recommendations for women over the age of 75. Still controversial whether the screening should occur every year, every other year. ACOG, American Cancer Society, all have slightly different recommendations. So as you've heard me say for a long time, Lindsay, 
women should check with their health care provider. This is not one size fits all. You were very specific about telling me that these are draft recommendations. Right. And so what does this mean going forward? So they're going to hear comments from experts, from the cancer community, from OBGYNs, uh, from radiologists, and they'll take those comments into account and, you know, maybe make some tweaks or modifications. But if everyone kind of concurs, then they'll finalize these draft recommendations around June 5th or 6th. Dr. Jen Ash, and we thank you so much as always Thanks, for your Lindsay. insight. You bet. The country is honoring the 50th anniversary of hip hop this year, and there's one iconic duo that has sung its way into the hip hop history books. Talking about Salt and Peppa, the two women sat down with Tamron Hall to discuss womanhood and the impact that these women have had in rap as we honor the 50th anniversary of hip hop. This year has been a reminder of the significance of hip hop. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you walked out on that Grammy stage, I, I went to Twitter immediately. And just the tweets from other famous yeah. artists, mm -hmm. from fans, just flooding but in. You know, Busta Rhymes and Salt and Pepper got the biggest cheer. <laughs> My daughter was like, Mom, did you hear them? I had to go back and listen. And I was like, oh, it's I true. was on my feet in my house. I was like, get it, girl, get it. Representing the lady. Representing the lady. The lady. Yes. It was an amazing feeling because we're coming from a time, first of all, we have to say when hip hop was a question, will it last? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Will it last? Yeah. And to be able to have to say to start that off to celebrate the 50th anniversary for hip hop is amazing. Yeah. And for us who had a, it's such a male dominated feel and had a hard time because mm -hmm. we were such a, you know, popular crossing over, selling millions. And um, they gave us a hard time, you know, say we were too pop, you too know. Too pop. Too pop, which <laughs> too is. Too sexy. Too sexy. Too yeah. everything. Oh, yeah. And what you always say, we brought what to the game? Fa uh, fun fashion and femininity. Fun yeah. fashion mm -hmm. and femininity, which yeah. is so appropriate that you were on the stage Grammys because you did mm -hmm. merge these worlds in a yeah. way no one had done, no man had done really. Yeah, yeah. When we started, I mm -hmm. mean, we were just being our authentic selves. We mm -hmm. dressed ourselves. We <laughs> made up our own. You got your salt pepper haircut. <laughs> Wait, we're gonna discuss it. <laughs> Thank you, salt. Thank you. We're gonna talk about that in a minute, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Like, <laughs> we just was making it up as mm -hmm. we went along. Like one of our iconic looks was the push it look, yeah. right? And that that whole look has a history because. There's a, a wonderful woman in Harlem who used to make Kente clothing mm -hmm. and hats. We got the hats from Mary. Are we referring to? Yes, girl, you know it. Yes. yes. That look yes. right there. That look right there with Kid, our boots. Um, play from Kid, Kid and Play. Kid and Play designed the jacket. Dapper Dan constructed the jacket. We went and just got us some spandex and those boots, boots, boots are from Favor, girl. <laughs> 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 These need to be baby. in my closet still today. Yes. That's what I was thinking about, just how wow. relevant, not only the fashion, but yes. also what you represent. You can go around the world and salt and pepper. Yeah. You say that, it's not just on our table. Exactly. It's everywhere in our ears, and people know what you're talking about. Yeah. When you're mapping it out, right. what's the best scenario that you thought would happen? Oh, the best scenario? This? I thought all of this. All, <laughs> all of this. this, yes. Like, Shoot. for me personally, like, as soon as I got on that microphone, I was like, this is what I'm gonna do with my life, oh. period. You know, I was the no plan B person. It just made me feel purposeful. It made me feel alive. It made me feel like it was my destiny. Our thanks to Tamarin for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Next hour, the federal charge is now dogging embattled Congressman George Santos, and a jury finds former President Donald Trump liable for sexual abuse and defamation against E. Jean Carroll, what may have led the jury to decide against him and how much he was ordered to pay. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights.
right now in America with so much at stake. Thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're gonna get on this show. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Almond Mom is a little bit bought into diet culture, but it tends to veer on the side of overdoing it. I had to hit spin class, you know, I had to earn this food. To be in a restrictive mode with food is almost like the worst joke ever. Food should not be good or bad. Every soul's body is important, no matter what size it is. Where body positivity has the potential to become detrimental is the, nah, girl, you're good. Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following a lot of developing news tonight, including the decision handed down by a jury against Donald Trump, now held liable for battery and defamation in the E. Jean Carroll rape case, how he's responding tonight. The charges against embattled Congressman George Santos by federal prosecutors. The new details being revealed about the shooting suspect behind that Allen, Texas mall massacre. The woman rescued after five days in the woods, surviving on just wine and lollipops. And Abbott Elementary star Cheryl Lee Ralph is shining a light on the struggles teachers face every day, plus a whole lot more. But we do begin with the verdict in the civil trial accusing former President Trump of sexual assault and defamation. The jury found Trump liable for battery and defamation in the suit by E. Jean Carroll and awarded her $5 million. The former magazine columnist claimed that Trump raped her in a dressing room back in the 90s, but she couldn't remember exactly when the alleged activity took place. The former president did not appear at his own trial, but the jury heard what he said in a deposition. Our senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky reports. Well, historically, that's true with stars. He bragged in his deposition that stars could get away with sexually assaulting women. But tonight, a jury in New York took less than three hours to find that former President Donald Trump sexually abused writer E. Jean Carroll, ordering him to pay her $5 million in damages. How do you feel? How do you feel? The six men and three women of the jury found that Trump sexually abused Carol in a department store dressing room in the 1990s, though they were not convinced he raped her as she had claimed. They did agree Trump defamed Carol by calling her story a complete con job, a hoax and a lie, and insisting Carol was not my type. Carol's lawyers seized on that statement, showing the jury the moment in a deposition when Trump saw a photo of Carol and confused her for his ex-wife, Marla Maples. It's Marla. You say Marla's in this photo? 
That's Marla. Yeah, that's that's my wife. Which woman are you pointing to? No. That's Here. Carol. Oh, that, the oh, person okay. you just pointed to was oh, Eugene Carroll. Oh, Carroll's team said that moment proved Carroll was exactly Donald Trump's type. And they argued the way he treated her fit a pattern of behavior. Two other women testified he had assaulted them, too. And jurors heard Trump's own words on the now infamous Access Hollywood video. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Carroll's team called that a confession pressing Trump in his deposition. Well, historically, that's true with stars. It's true with stars that, that they can grab women by the Well, that's what, it's, if you look over the last million years, I guess that's been largely true, not always, but largely true, unfortunately or fortunately. Trump, who was repeatedly given the opportunity to testify, never once attended the trial, a decision his attorney defended today. What more can he say other than I didn't do it? Tonight, Trump calling the verdict a disgrace, a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. His lawyer says he will appeal. Could be a long, drawn-out process still. Aaron Katursky joins us now. What is E. Jean Carroll saying tonight, Aaron? In a statement issued after court, Lindsay, E. Jean Carroll said she filed this lawsuit to clear her name and restore her life. She also said that the world now finally knows the truth about what happened. E. Jean Carroll called the outcome here, Lindsay, a victory not just for her, but for all women who have suffered because they have not been believed. Bye, Lindsay? Bye. Aaron Katursky for us. Thanks so much, Aaron. Former President Trump came out with a quick but brief response on his social media platform, Truth Social, calling the verdict a disgrace and part of the greatest witch hunt of all time. ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, joins us now. And John, it sounds like the former president and his team are already planning to repeal. Uh, they say that it already will appeal. But look, Lindsay, this is the latest in a long string of losses uh, for Donald Trump in court. And there are likely to be more losses to come or more legal setbacks to come. Uh, they will appeal this. But this is more than a legal setback or even a financial setback for Donald Trump. It is also a political setback. You now have the judgment of a jury that he committed sexual abuse. And in the course of this case, you had, once again, the lowest point of Donald Trump's political career, perhaps, the Access Hollywood tape, come back to the fore, uh, people hearing that again, and also hearing him say yet again that he believes that celebrities, stars, uh, are able to sexually assault women. And in this case, he actually made it worse uh, by adding those words, unfortunately or fortunately. So you can be sure that whoever Donald Trump runs against, either in the Republican primaries or in the general election, if he gets there, uh, will remind voters of what he said in this case and what the jury said uh, that he did. Jonathan Carl for us from the nation's capital. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, Lindsay. Now to breaking news out of Washington. Sources tell ABC News that federal prosecutors have just filed criminal charges against embattled New York Congressman George Santos. Santos has admitted to lying about many parts of his life, including his resume, his college degree, also his family background. ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott is on Capitol Hill. Rachel, what do we know about these charges and what's next for Santos? Well, Lindsay, sources are telling us tonight that Congressman George Santos could appear in court as early as tomorrow. The exact charges remain unknown. They are under seal in that indictment. But Republican Congressman George Santos has been accused of fabricating almost every detail of his life, from his resume to his background. But sources tell us that the focus of this investigation is on the money and whether or not he illegally used campaign finances. Santos has still refused to answer many questions, including how he made $55,000 and then personally loaned his campaign more than half a million dollars two years later. We also know that the FBI has been looking into whether he used a fake charity to rip off a veteran and his dying dog. Sources tell me that Santos was caught off guard by this announcement. He has refused to step down through it all, remaining defiant. And tonight, his office declined to comment, Lindsay. Rachel Scott for us from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Rachel. Now to the investigation into the mass shooting at the mall in Allen, Texas. Police say the suspect had eight weapons with three on him, all of them purchased legally. They confirmed his social media included references to Nazi ideology as well as hateful messages about women and minorities. ABC's chief national correspondent Matt Gutman is in Allen, Texas tonight. 
Authorities revealing tonight the suspect who wreaked terror on that Dallas area mall, murdering eight, purchased all of his guns legally. He had eight weapons with him. He had three on his person and he had five in his vehicle. Investigators reviewing this picture of the 33-year-old suspect, Mauricio Garcia, and his social media profile. We do know that he had neo-Nazi ideation. He had patches, he had tattoos, uh, even his signature, you know, verified that. Images uploaded to an account last month indicating the gunman may have visited the outlet mall multiple times over the past year, even researching its peak hours. To me, it looks like he targeted the location rather than a specific group of people. Is there any way that you think you can protect the public from the next mass shooting if anyone, a suspect like this man, who we know was discharged from the military over mental health concerns, can go out and purchase an armload of firearms? When you have people with mental illness, if, this, if it turns out that this gentleman has that, uh, when you have that situation, they will find a way. Tonight, with that memorial growing, the names of all eight victims released. Among them, Q and Cindy Cho murdered with their three-year-old son, James. Their six-year-old, William, the only survivor. Just so heart-wrenching. Our thanks to Matt for that. Up to 10,000 migrants a day are expected to flood the southern border, where once Title 42 is expected to expire Thursday night. President Biden has sent 500 regular troops. Texas National Guard troops are there as well. In El Paso, ICE agents have been waking up migrants to warn them to register or risk being sent home right away. That's where our Maria Villarreal reports from tonight. Tonight, ICE agents going tent to tent forcing migrants in El Paso to pack up and get processed now or risk deportation. It comes as more Texas National Guard troops head to the border, over 900 stationed in El Paso alone as the end nears for Title 42, that Trump-era health policy allowing authorities to quickly expel migrants based on COVID concerns. If they cross the border illegally, they're going to be sent back and they're going to be barred from seeking asylum for five years. Authorities bracing for up to 10,000 migrants crossing daily. And this is where they want to get to, this wall in El Paso where hundreds already wait to come in. This man wiping away tears. He says he's been waiting for eight days. Is your crime because you're happy? <sighs> but tonight, frustration along the border. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs critical of the federal government's response. Without much more robust action from the federal government, the current situation will only get worse. And now Chicago and New York State declaring states of emergency. New York's Governor Kathy Hochul saying, quote, a disaster is imminent. Our thanks to Maria for that. Now to the debt ceiling showdown with the risk of default looming just weeks away. President Biden and congressional leaders of both parties met today at the White House, but they remain deadlocked. So what happens next? Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Just weeks away from potential default and with the American economy hanging in the balance, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy today heading to the White House for that critical face-to-face -face meeting. The president, is finally willing to negotiate. the president insists he will do no such thing, welcoming the top four congressional leaders to the Oval Office to demand that Congress raise the debt limit and pay the nation's bills without conditions. We're going to get started. We're going to solve all the world's problems. Okay. Mr. President, can you Republicans say they won't raise the debt limit unless Biden agrees to deep spending cuts that would gut his agenda, slashing social spending and environmental programs. Biden accuses Republicans of holding the economy hostage. I didn't see any new movement. Without an agreement, the U.S. is expected to run out of money to pay its bills as soon as June 1st. Social security payments will halt. Troops will go unpaid. The stock market will plunge. Interest rates will spike. And by one projection, six million people could lose their jobs. Tonight, President Biden's not ruling out invoking the 14th Amendment, which would allow him to raise the debt ceiling on his own. I made clear during our meeting that default is not an option. Our thanks to Mary for that. In Moscow tonight, Russian President Vladimir Putin presided over Victory Day celebrations, the country's biggest national holiday. Celebrations were scaled back this year. A lone Soviet-era tank drove into Red Square, followed by armored vehicles with no modern tanks in the traditional military parade. Putin blamed the West for unleashing a real war, even as a new barrage of Russian missiles target Kyiv. ABC's Marcus Moore is in Ukraine. Tonight, a dramatically scaled-down Victory Day parade in Moscow, marking the Nazis' defeat in 1945. 
a lone World War II era T-34 rumbled across Red Square, which in years past would have been filled with modern Russian tanks. A defiant Vladimir Putin claiming the West had unleashed, quote, a real war against Russia and compared Ukraine to Nazi Germany. There was also no military flyover today as in the past, and parades in at least two dozen other Russian cities were canceled. It comes a week after a purported drone attack on the Kremlin that raised questions about security there, though it is still not clear who was behind it. The anemic show of force today, a reflection of Russia's degraded military on the battlefield, still unable to take towns like Bakhmut it has fought over nine months for. Ukrainians also claim to have shot down 23 of 25 missiles launched by Russians today. And the Pentagon confirming a U.S.-made Patriot missile shot down a Russian hypersonic missile over Ukraine last week. The Russians claim the hypersonic missile can fly at Mach 10, faster than two miles per second. Our thanks to Marcus there. Turning now to the Middle East, where at least 10 Palestinians have been killed in strikes by Israeli defense forces. The Palestinian Ministry of Health said the IDF's operation happened early Tuesday morning in Gaza. Three senior members of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad were killed, along with at least a dozen civilians. In a press release, the IDF said that they were striking Islamic Jihad targets in Gaza. The Home Front Command instructed civilians in the area surrounding Gaza to shelter in place. The IDF closed all border points connected to the Gaza. A strip. A new draft recommendation for women suggesting most women with average risk should start screening for breast cancer at age 40 and they should get screened every other year through age 74. This is according to new guidance out today from a federal task force whose decisions guide insurance policies. Prior task force recommendations said women should start screening at age 50 but said women in their 40s with higher risk factors should consider screening at younger ages. We'll have more on this with our chief medical correspondent Dr. Jen Ashton later on in the program. So much more to get to tonight coming up she's a force in the fashion industry and not just for her designs aurora james tells us how she's chronicling her story from childhood to the activist who pushed big box stores to create more space for black owned businesses but next the unprecedented and deadly protests in pakistan what's leading to the escalating clashes whenever news breaks the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Manhattan, I'm Diane Macedo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Tonight, there are unprecedented protests in Pakistan following the arrest of former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan. Protesters have reached the army's headquarters. At least six people have been killed so far in clashes. Khan was arrested Tuesday on corruption charges. He's called the charges a politically motivated plot by his successor. 
Sri Lanka's Supreme Court has cleared the way for a bill seeking to decriminalize homosexuality. LGBTQ activists have been pushing for this change for years. Homosexuality in Sri Lanka is still punishable by a prison sentence and a fine. The bill still must get the support of Parliament. A Christie's auction of 700 pieces of Austrian jewelry is sparking a controversy tonight. The jewelry collection from a late Austrian heiress was in part built off of desperate Jews selling their jewelry as they fled the Nazis in the 1930s. Proceeds initially were set to go to the Vienna Art Museum and other funds, but as criticism has grown, Christie says that it will chip in some of the profits to Holocaust education. A woman in Australia says that she survived five days in the wilderness north of Melbourne on the only thing she had in her car, wine and lollipops. Authorities looked for her for days after her relatives say that she failed to check in. Turns out her car got stuck in the mud and her cell phone was out of range. She doesn't drink. The wine was supposed to be a gift for her mother. The rescue teams did find her. Her request was simple, water and a cigarette. Our next guest is a fashion powerhouse. She's a designer, entrepreneur, and the current vice chair of the Council of Fashion Designers of America. Aurora's latest accomplishment, a memoir, Wildflower, captures her journey to becoming a leading activist whose call for department stores to carry more black-owned brands sparked an entire movement. Aurora, thank you so much for joining us today. With the wildflower dress. Oh my gosh, dress, thank you so no much less. for having me. So let's talk about the vulnerability and why you decided to share your story with the world, including yeah. the complex relationship you had with your mom and abuse that you suffered on the hands of your stepfather. Yeah, I think it's so important now more than ever, and especially today, to be frank with you, for women to tell our stories, right? And a lot of people have said to me, oh my gosh, you know, you're still in your 30s, why are you writing a memoir now? And I think especially in the advent of social media, there's been so much pressure put on women, especially young women, to present as perfect all the time, to look a certain way, to do all the things. And I think for me, I just really kind of wanted to redefine success on my own terms and, and let people understand that you can have all the kind of bumps and bruises along the way and still be perfectly positioned to follow your dreams. And I think that's what I've done. I think you've done a, a really successful job at that. <laughs> Let's you. talk about the 15% pledge, which you started back in 2020, ah. which was essentially to commit, uh, make sure that businesses would commit 15% of their shelf space to black owned businesses. How's that doing now? Oh my gosh, I have to tell you, it's been phenomenal. We're coming up on our third year. Um, we're now one of the fastest growing nonprofits in America in terms of impact. We have 29 of the largest companies in the country that have signed multi-year contracts with a 15% pledge. Nordstrom, for example, signed a 10-year contract with us. We've put 625 black-owned brands onto the shelves of major retailers, and we're in the process of reallocating over $10 billion of annual revenue to black-owned businesses per year year, which is really exciting. It's super impressive. What else do you think can be done to encourage black owned businesses, to encourage big box stores to yeah. be more inclusive? Yeah. Well, to be honest with you, I think everyone needs to sign the pledge because I think we're so used to hearing these kind of proclamations from companies about the things that they want to do and how they want to feel. But oftentimes that doesn't come with long term accountability. And what a lot of people don't realize is the 15 percent pledge is a nonprofit. There's 20 women that work there and we actually work with people to hold them accountable and to partner with them along the way to make sure that they're being good partners and that we're actually getting the best product onto shelves. And you founded your own sustainable fashion line back in 2013. Tell us about that brand and what inspired you to start it. Oh my gosh, Brother Veli's. So I was traveling in Southern Africa. My father was born and raised in Ghana. And I fell in love with uh, a shoe called a Velskoon, which is actually a traditional Southern African shoe, which we know today is a desert boot. And most people don't realize that a desert boot is actually an African shoe. So I work oh. with artisans all across Africa and now also Mexico and Haiti and Italy and America to create this, uh, uh, what I believe is a really incredible collection of artisanal shoes that are all made sustainably and and, and uh, it's such a labor of love, but I love it so much. And I launched it with $3,500 at a flea market in Manhattan's Lower East Side. And you know, now I'm the Look vice chair of the CFTA. <laughs> Dreams can come true. <laughs> Let's talk about sustainability in fashion because that's yeah. obviously something that you're passionate about. And a lot of yeah. people aren't really thinking about it. Explain why it's so important. You know, when we think about fast fashion, what we don't often think about is the fact that the people who are hurt in that proposition the most are women. Because most of the people in sweatshops are women and they're also women of color. And as consumers, we really need to start thinking about every dollar we spend as a vote. Because really what we spend our money on is what's gonna continue to grow and thrive in this country. 
I want to take a look of you at the Met Gala just last yeah. week. <laughs> and obviously, you also designed AOC's Tax the Rich dress, yeah. right? And really, for you, it seems that activism and fashion go hand in hand. Yeah, I mean, I think it, what's so important for me and what's always been so important for me as a designer is making sure that women show up as the best versions of themselves in every single room that they enter. And so that's really how I think about design and really putting that woman first and making sure that she really wears her heart on her sleeve. You said it's a story that in so many ways is about all of us and the pressures we feel to blossom even in the harshest of conditions. What's your message of hope to people who are experiencing a, a really difficult time? Part of the reason that I wrote this book was because I wanted people to understand that no matter what has happened to you in your life, whether it was abuse or any other kind of tragedy, you're actually perfectly positioned to go after exactly what you want. Aurora, we thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank One you for our having me. To know that Wildflower is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, demanding more for teachers. One of the stars of the hit show Abbott Elementary is shining the spotlight on educators who do so much. Almond Mom is a little bit bought into diet culture, but it tends to veer on the side of overdoing it. I had to hit spin class, you know, I had to earn this food. To be in a restrictive mode with food is almost like the worst joke ever. Food should not be good or bad. Every soul's body is important, no matter what size it is. Where body positivity has the potential to become detrimental is the, nah, girl, you're good. Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. It is Teacher Appreciation Week, and Abbott Elementary star Cheryl Lee Ralph is shining a light on the struggles teachers face every day, saying they deserve more. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has this story. Welcome to the Philly public school system where you never have what you need. Abbott Elementary's Barbara Howard never won to withhold her opinion. This work is a desk for your student, Mrs. Howard. Mr. Johnson, that is a dining table from the cafeteria, and you are a fool. Oh! Just like the woman who plays her, Cheryl Lee Ralph. Why do we not value our country more that we make sure that teachers get respectable pay for the job that they're doing. The Emmy-winning actress joining a town hall, hosted by the National Education Association and the National Parent Teacher Association, putting teachers... Science is fun with Mandy Jung. ...in the spotlight. When I was starting out, it was really, really hard. I was working extra jobs. I was working in the summer. On average, teachers spend nearly $700 from their own pocket towards school supplies, many taking a second job to make ends meet. If we're going to attract more people to the profession, we need to take care of our early career educators. Between 2020 and 2022, more than 300,000 teachers and school staff quit. All the more reason many want to figure out a way to support educators like Ms. Jung. They're so excited and hungry and curious and they keep me on my toes and they keep me laughing. Hank has two turkeys, he gets two more. As for Cheryl Lee Ralph, she's thrilled Abbott Elementary showcases both the trials and the joy of teaching. You know, it's, it just makes me feel so good that we can shine a good light on some of the most important people in our lives, teachers, educators.
She is certainly shining her light. Our thanks to Eva for that. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families.